podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, and welcome to today's WCET webcast on consortium service models. My name is Megan Raymond. I am the Assistant Director of Programs and Sponsorship here at WCET. And suddenly our slides just vaporized. So I'm going to go ahead and let our moderator today, Tina Parskel, introduce our panelists, Russ, Kim, and Mary, while I get those slides back up. Go ahead, Tina. Great. Thank you, Megan. Sorry about the slides. Um, so welcome, everyone. I'm Tina Parskel. I'm the Executive Director of Colorado Community Colleges Online. CCC Online is the consortium of the 13 colleges in the Colorado Community College system. I'm joined today by three outstanding presenters, and I'm really excited about our conversation today. So I'd like to take a moment to have each of them introduce themselves to you now. First, we have Mary. Mary, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, you bet. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Mary Burgess, and I am the executive director of an organization called BC Campus, which is in British Columbia, Canada. Fantastic. Thank you, Mary. Next, we have Russ. Russ. Hi, yes. Uh, thank you so much for uh, all being part of this uh, session today. But I'm Russ Poulin. I direct uh, uh, policy and analysis issues for WCET, and glad to be here with you all. Fantastic. Thank you, Russ. And finally, we have Kim. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Kim Scalzo, and I'm the Executive Director of Open SUNY, which is the online learning initiative for the SUNY system. Fantastic. Well, thank you. Do you want to go back, um, yeah. Megan, to some of the introduction slides? I, I will. Thank you so much, Tina. So again, I'm Megan Raymond with WCET, and we are recording this webcast. We will send you a link to the archive and any resources that are shared. The webcast will also be posted on the WCET website and the YouTube channel if you'd like to share it once it concludes. And we also tend to have a pretty active Twitter back channel. If you'd like to follow along, the hashtag is WCET webcast. So today, we'll go ahead and skip part one, introductions. We'll move into survey results about the United States and Canadian Consortium Survey. Each consortium will share a little bit about who they serve, the services they provide, and successful processes. Then we'll move into a moderated discussion and then get to your questions and answers. So as we move through, please do post any questions that you have into the question box and we will be sure to get to those. Again, just go ahead and post your questions. If there are a lot of questions and we feel like we need to interject, we will certainly do so. And moving on. Oh, all right. Our first presenter is Russ. So go ahead, Russ. Sorry. Okay, you've got it. There you go. All right, you've got a, you've got a touchy computer today. Yes. So we'll. We'll be gentle with with Megan on these things, and so uh, thank you all. So uh, Tina has been uh, very helpful, being part of a group of a, where we're doing a survey of uh, consortia and system leaders who focus on uh, e-learning, uh, online learning issues across their multi-institutional uh, organizations. And then here's a, a first chance for us to give uh, some of the results uh, today. Uh, I'm going to focus on the service part of the questions, and I'm going to uh, go through these uh, through these pretty pretty quickly. But we did ask about we, were, we received about 32 uh, responses uh, from uh, different uh, consortia systems in Canada and in the U.S. And the orange there, the uh, it's orangish color. The color on the left uh, is uh, that they've offered this service for more than three years, and then the the bluish grayish color on the right is that they have been offering uh, for, for fewer than, th than three years. And so you can see that with the academic services that there's still quite a number of uh, uh, groups that are offering uh, uh, faculty development, that that's something that's very common. Uh, the course, uh, course sharing sort of things where students from different campuses can enroll in courses from other places is also, also very common. And one of the things that we'll note as we go through these that, that uh, most of the services that uh, the, the uh, 
uh, consortia or systems have been offering uh, for over three years, uh, and there's only a few that we see that are, out, that are on the uh, newer side. And, and it's interesting to note that the OER keeps coming up as one of the ones that is uh, uh, really taken off as being a, a new one over the last few years. Let's move to the to the next slide, which uh, uh, looks at student services, uh, and that this is one. Uh, uh, where the readiness for online learning, and we're all used to uh, 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 different services that would be offered by smarter, uh, uh, smarter services, yeah, and then or also people have their own uh, little surveys where they ask about the readiness uh, for that. I actually, got some comments where there's a few who've moved out of that uh, over the last few years, but it's a fairly easy one to offer that you can see that um, online course development is another one assistance with that that, that uh, a lot of people have done. And then let's move to the next uh, section, and that has to do with uh, uh, some of the technologies. Now, a lot of uh, a lot of the uh, consortia or systems that are supporting their institutions got involved because their the technologies were difficult, and that they uh, were offering services with with those that we uh, see here that the uh, that we still see some uh, shared research on technologies, and which is a a good way for institutions to uh, work together and to share what they've learned uh, because uh, there's the thing that we know is that there's always going to be something new and rather than everybody uh, uh, doing the research on their own that they can work together and then try out some new software or hardware and then share what they've learned and then uh, and then it uh, saves uh, time and money for doing that. Uh, interesting that the, the centralized uh, uh, technology there that there's still there's only about half they're doing that sort of central uh, course hosting or, or that and that probably was uh, something that we saw quite a bit of in the er in the uh, early days of uh, of consortia that they were kind of built around these uh, technologies and now the issues have probably moved more beyond technologies to all these other other issues with that let's move on to uh, the final category that we had uh, which was in the planning and administrative uh, services um, not surprisingly, brokering partnerships, you know, you know, getting institutions to work together is the uh, the top thing that they're doing uh, there. Uh, the other one that uh, well over half were doing was in the data gathering. And again, that's uh, uh, not surprising as well, because quite often uh, in terms of uh, either because the institutions want to know what's happened in terms of course sharing or, or, or what they've done together, or uh, there's some entity, the, the system or the legislature that they have to report to for their funds uh, that they uh, need to show that, oh, look, at the, here's the number of students that we served by working together. So uh, it's not surprising that those are some of, the, uh, some of the top ones. Now, the survey, you know, I've gone through, I'm going through these pretty quickly. We're hoping to have the survey out in, let's say, September-ish. Maybe maybe August. Why don't we say September-ish, uh, and that we'll do quite a bit of discussion of this at a uh, a session at the annual meeting in October. Uh, that'll we'll have a half-day uh, session where we'll have a workshop where we'll talk about these issues, the results of the survey, but also expanding more about how uh, what consortia can be and systems can be doing to uh, help each other and how to make how to make that work. So be watching for more more details on all of this. Let's move to the next slide, uh, which talks about, remember I said that we weren't seeing loads of things in new services, and because uh, we did ask, we were wondering, well, you know, what are people, what is emerging that is out there? And, and what we were seeing was that uh, they were kind of all over the map in terms of uh, uh, what they were focusing on, but uh, if you take the first, third, and fourth one that they kind of went together that we were seeing this uh, 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 and then these new services, you know, that are really was uh, meant to look at, you know, what is going to happen in the next few years? You know, what will they be adding from here going forward? And so, again, the whole move around the open uh, OER, uh, open textbooks, and then creating repository, repositories uh, uh, for the OER as well, that that, that, that all sort of uh, fit, uh, fit together. And then... Uh, and then you see a number of other things that uh, that that people are are doing. And you see down there at the bottom with the uh, two respondents. But it it, it did seem that uh, to me, it seemed in the past that quite often people were going off and doing shared technologies or MOOCs or what have you. 
And it seems a little bit more uh, all over the map uh, now in terms of uh, what's new. And I imagine that uh, people are just, uh, uh, these consortia and systems are doing just a better job of figuring out, okay, what do our members need? And then, and then uh, uh, addressing that rather than uh, always going and get the, uh, going after the bright, shiny object. Let's move on to the uh, next one. And just, uh, I, I did pull out a few quotes uh, from uh, some of those who, uh, who responded because we had some open-ended questions and then just some things that uh, uh, that uh, that they've uh, talked about in terms of uh, uh, the changes in services and what they've seen and how they've uh, how they've addressed those those things and that this one I sort of liked because it really uh, hits home in terms of just the direct feedback from our members and that the importance of making sure that you're in line with uh, where their needs are or, or where their where their needs might be going and trying to help them to uh, look around the corner to see what's what's coming to make sure that you're you remain uh, relevant in terms of meeting their needs because we have seen at times that some of the consortia systems have become a bit stagnant and then um, do they still have value anymore if they're not not moving with the member needs let's move to the next uh, next slide and then uh, these are these are some that talk about uh, uh, just changes in terms of uh, how they're operating with their members uh, uh, and that the uh, uh, first one that they're going to uh, uh, opt in services rather than finding a service that is something that would be needed for everyone maybe some institutions maybe smaller ones need this or others are very interested in a certain technology where uh, not all of the institutions were that are a part of them that they're doing that uh, the uh, uh, the second one has to do, uh, you know, that they're changing their fo they're expanding their focus, that they used to do one thing and that they've uh, moved on to do uh, more things. Uh, and then the other is uh, just, had, you know, how they're offering it. You notice that with the uh, faculty training was very popular, but now uh, they're not doing as much direct faculty training as much as moving to a train the trainer type of model. And finally, we'll go to my last uh, slide here. And, uh, uh, we did get quite a few things about money issues, <laughs> and I picked out, and, and I have a whole host of them, but I did uh, pick out two here, and I'll just uh, leave those with, the, with those, but kind of the underlying uh, thing is that as well as staying uh, in line with what your members need is also uh, figuring out where the economics are going. What is it that the institutions can afford? What will you, if there's a large if you're state funded or provincially funded if is there uh, a large cut you know what what in your appropriations what can you do are you um, making sure that you have alternative lines of uh, uh, income and so you know what can you do to make sure uh, that you're staying ahead of whatever the changes are uh, that are happening in terms of the uh, uh, funding that either your institutions or uh, 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 from the state or you know however it is or grants or however you're getting money that you're staying ahead of ahead of those issues so with that we have a lot more to the survey as I said that we'll um, be uh, uh, getting that report out to you and then letting you know about it we'll, uh, we'll certainly uh, make that make that well known and with that for people who actually are now doing this stuff day to day we're going to go ahead and turn to Kim to talk about open SUNY thanks Russ um, and um, I think what what I'd like to just set as some context is um, that you know open SUNY is the evolution of what was the SUNY learning network uh, so we've been doing this for um, you know more than uh, 20 years almost 25 years now and so we've really seen some changes in our services so I'm going to share with you what we're doing in that context Kim, I think we lost your audio. How about now? Can you hear me, Megan? Yes, that's great. Thanks. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so um, this slide just gives you a sense of our scale in terms of the number of campuses and students and programs, courses, et cetera, that we, we serve, and just to you know, show you that we are pretty geographically dispersed across the system. So um, I think that's all I'm going to say there. Um, if you can go to the next slide. 
So um, I'm, I'm sharing our mission slide with you because when I came into Open SUNY three years ago, um, uh, and we were kind of in this um, mode of evolving from what was the SUNY Learning Network to a more system level strategy for um, online learning with Open SUNY, we really wanted to get very focused on who we were serving and what the services were that we would provide. And so um, what you see in the um, kind of narrative um, or bulleted list at the top there is really what we view as our role and, um, uh, and the kinds of things that we're, we'll be doing as an organization. So, um, you know, providing exemplary models um, and then some um, uh, um, camp, some uh, delivery of services to campuses where that's needed, but much more on the advocacy of um, policy and infrastructure and resources and promoting and engaging in research and innovation. And then across the bottom, um, we have four target audiences that our services are focused on, um, and that was very deliberate um, so that we and campuses could be on the same page about what we were serving. And that's something I would say that was a lesson learned from us um, in, as we evolved from the SUNY Learning Network to Open SUNY was so that, that we and campuses knew kind of um, and were on the same page about who we were trying to serve and what services we would provide them. Um, okay, so go to the next slide. So now what I'm going to do is try to highlight a couple of the um, services and talk about how they've evolved and, and, um, and why they've evolved the way that they have, I guess. Um, so in that um, campus supports us um, uh, um, section, um, those really, I think, align with what Russ just um, you know, talked about in terms of the planning and administrative um, services, as well as some of the, the technology uh, services. And that's really about how are we, how are we engaging our campus leaders to help them in their roles um, with their responsibility for leading online learning initiatives. And so it's a range of um, Open SUNY Plus is really about a designation on the degree or certificate program, which means that, that faculty and students can count on some additional supports in those programs. Um, uh, the Institutional Readiness and Enrollment Planning Roundtable are actually consulting engagements that we do with our campuses to try and bring those campus leaders into the conversation about how online learning fits into their overall strategies. Um, we do have the um, uh, searchable program and course websites. Um, we provide some technology support and contracts. The campus dashboards is a new service, which I'm gonna talk about in a minute. And then for all of our audiences, we have a community of practice and competency development. So. In the campus leaders, we, these are really fairly new services um, that we're really trying to use to help our campuses think more strategically and ensure quality in online learning. On the student support side, oh, I'm sorry, I'm going to still talk about students for a second, Megan, um, or whoever is um, uh, um, clicking. Um, so this is really, um, really kind of at two levels. The first is um, a concierge model, so we recommend that um, every campus have um, some form of a concierge or a primary point of contact for their students to, to be their interface to the rest of the campus. And then everything else that follows are resources or tools that the concierge can use or bring to bear to support their students. Um, and that is fairly new for us. In the early days of the SUNY Learning Network, we focused much more on faculty services. So these are um, fairly new services for us. Um, now we can go to the, um, the next um, slide. Um, on the faculty supports, um, we fall into that category that you described, Russ, of where our really our history and our heritage of the SUNY Learning Network is in faculty support and faculty development. So we have very well established models and um, rubrics and standards for um, what it takes to teach online effectively and how to prepare faculty to teach online effectively. So um, we do not do very much direct faculty training anymore. We do much more of providing support um, to uh, um, instructional designers and others who are working with faculty to, um, uh, uh, you know, to, to help them, them in their roles on the campuses. We do have a help desk for faculty, and we do have the community of practice, um, uh, and that competency development is mostly for those train the trainers. Um, one of our target audiences, which I, I mentioned very, I, I may not even mention them, but um, gloss over quickly, was New York State employers. Um, and we're really trying to think about what they need in terms of programs. So this is probably the newest area of service for us. 
um, where we're providing um, some support for developing new programs, for determining where new programs are needed, and that Enrollment Planning Roundtable, again, is one of those consulting engagements where we bring campus leaders together to um, think about where are there opportunities for growth, uh, what is the market saying is needed in terms of jobs and what credentials are needed for those jobs. And then we're also doing um, some new um, work in terms of partnership facilitation with employer organizations. Um, so those are, that's kind of roughly um, our services and, and how they've evolved, I would say. If you want to go to the next slide, um, Megan, I'll highlight um, where I think we've had, um, you know, some successes and and you know why they are successful. Um, the first one I'm going to talk about is our um, searchable um, program website. Um, we actually did that um, as a result of a pilot with a vendor where we um, really focused our website on making it easy for prospective students to search for our programs across the system and to find matches and then to pass those leads onto our campuses. And you can see there that we really increased our lead generation. Campuses have found tremendous value in this and, um, uh, and, and has led to us um, expanding this initiative in, in, the, in the next few years, we're gonna be doing even more in this area. Um, the next one I wanna talk about is our campus dashboards. So um, Russ, you talked about data. A lot of um, you know, consortium systems are looking at data. That's something that we, um, in the last few years, have been looking at a little more closely. And one of the things that we have found is that um, our campuses uh, all um, think about data from their perspectives. While they all do federal reporting and they do some central reporting to the system, um, it was not all consistent and we weren't getting accurate reporting from all of our campuses. So by creating the dashboards that we're able to share back with all of our campuses, they are able to see what, what when we count numbers of courses or programs or students across the system, how many of that comes from their campuses. And they are, um, uh, the people who care about online learning um, are seeing that and going back to their campuses. And we're seeing much more um, improved accuracy and consistency of reporting now as a result of that. So I think they have found that to be a tremendous value. It also gives them a mechanism for comparing what they're doing on their individual campus with others across the system, and also to compare that with national data, because we are aligning our standards and definitions with national um, standards and definitions. So um, those two um, I wanted to mention. And if you go to the next um, slide, Megan, I'll just mention um, um, one more, um, which is the um, Early Alerts Initiative. Um, and the reason that I want to mention this is because um, while many campuses are implementing early alert systems to support student success. We have taken um, an approach to do that as part of building a community of practice. And we have, um, uh, in doing so, are pairing up experienced campuses with newly implementing campuses. And, um, and they're serving as mentors. Those experienced campuses are serving as mentors to the new campuses. That's a fairly new model for us that we're building into our community of practice. And we're starting now to expand that to other services that we're offering. Um, so I think um, that's probably um, as much time as I want to take. There are other things that I could talk about, of course. Um, and I've tried to provide some links there for people who are interested in some of those things. But um, I think. Um, um, I'll just wrap up by saying that we continue to survey our um, members and we ask them two questions. We ask them um, what types of services are valuable to them in ensuring the success of their online programs. And then we ask them how effective they think a, that particular service is that we're delivering to them. And so we've done that now for two years and that's continuing to inform the evolution of our services going forward. And I think okay. Mary. I was going to say, I think it's over to me now. Is that, should I go, Tina? Yep, absolutely. Thank you, Mary. Awesome. No problem. Uh, so um, thank you so much for having me. Um, I am going to talk about our much smaller organization with our much smaller population in Canada um, than, than Kim's dealing with. Um, 
but many of the same kinds of services, interestingly. So BC Campus was created in 2003, uh, and we're funded by the uh, BC Ministry of Advanced Education, Skills and Training. Um, and at that time, the organization was put together sort of out of uh, a couple of other organizations who were doing similar work. Um, and, and what government was really looking for from us at that time was to help institutions as they moved into the world of online learning. Uh, and we still do that, but we have other stuff as well. Although, interestingly, we have been moving back into online um, in more strategic ways, I would say, in the last year about, um, and, and are continuing to do that following some um, research that's been done across Canada around uh, how institutions are doing online learning, their readiness, um, their strategies, and things like that. So we've been working in that area a little bit again. Um, so about um, about 10 years ago, um, we started getting a bit bogged down with some operational um, work at BC campus. So we we had several, um, we had projects and, and the work, I'll talk about our services in a second, but we had some, the, the primarily our, our mandate is to uh, improve student learning in BC post-secondary institutions by supporting um, teaching, learning, educational technology and open education in the 25 public post-secondary institutions in British Columbia, uh, which is a pretty diverse system. Um, we've got uh, colleges, technical colleges, uh, institutes, teaching universities, and research institutions. So it's a, it is a pretty diverse system. Um, but what we were finding was happening is that we were getting a bit bogged down with operations because we, what one of the things government wants from us is to help with advancing thinking around student learning. And so we had things like pilots that didn't have implementation plans or sunsetting plans um, and, and other, uh, other projects that had continued on longer and had become sort of operational in a way that prevented BC campus from moving ahead into other areas of innovation. Uh, so we worked with government about five years ago, I guess now, to shift some of those responsibilities. Um, and so we are now very much um, more focused on seeding, innovation, pilot, sandboxing, um, that kind of work. Um, sort of, I, I, I like to think of us as kind of an R&D slash skunk works organization, um, which yes, is awesome and, and a really fun space to work in, I'm not gonna lie. Um, and it's, it's really, um, it's, it's fun not to have to work in operation, so we're, we're happy to be able to move away from that a little bit. Um, and I wanted to say we used to be a lot more technology focused and we have moved, um, we have moved some of that work to another organization here in BC called BCNet. So we used to do technology shared services. So um, if a bunch of institutions wanted to use the same learning management system, for example, we would do the shared service um, license negotiation and all that kind of stuff for that. We don't do that work anymore. More. Um, now we will do the community of practice that talks about how to use those technologies in pedagogically sound ways or innovative ways, but we don't get involved in things like licensing anymore. Um, and interestingly, uh, Russ, when you were talking about the new areas that people are exploring, that's really where we are. So including the learning objects repository, although all of our learning objects are OER. And so that's a that's a space that we do a lot of work in. So I'm going to say ding now for Megan. I don't know. I'm guessing many of you are uh, this, are the age like me who remembers uh, listening to books on records instead of from Audible. And I remember having books that it would ding at the point in the story when you were supposed to shift the page. So I always think of that when we're doing this. Uh, so I wanted to tell you a little bit about our lines of service and uh, and just a little bit about each. And you, you can see in the pictures, we bring people together a lot uh, and that's a really significant part of our work. Uh, these three pictures are all from different events that we did last year. Um, and so, uh, so that, as I say, that's a big part of our work. And so our open education um, group has, well, the BC Open Textbook 
uh, project in it, which has around 250 uh, open textbooks, as well as more than a thousand ancillary resources in it. Um, <clears throat> they also do an open education research fellows program, uh, work with institutions around open pedagogy practices, and things like awards for open educators to incentivize that work. Uh, and so some of you may have seen um, members of our team like Amanda Coolidge at various events uh, all around the world um, talking about that open work. Uh, the next um, group there is our learning, teaching and educational technology. Uh, and these guys are really deeply into teaching and learning in BC and helping to promote its importance. We've done a lot of work um, from BC campus and I would say the last two or three years to really advance the notion of learning and teaching as something that needs to underlie all of the other work that we're doing with learning technologies open in all of those areas, we really want people to be thinking fundamentally about student learning as they're, as they're working in all of these areas. So we do things like um, helping with ed tech innovation and a pedagogical focus on those tools. We do ed tech pilots. So for example, we are right now in the midst of a pilot of Blackboard Ally, uh, which is a tool for accessibility uh, with five of our institutions. And that evaluation of that tool will include not only um, whether or not from a technical perspective or a functional perspective it's what the institutions need, but whether from a student learning perspective it's going to be a useful tool. Um, we also do uh, lots of learning and teaching events and, and learning opportunities. Uh, we have a symposium um, on scholarly inquiry that we run every fall, so people bring their subtle projects to that and um, learn from each other's foibles and, um, and successes. We do liberating structures workshops. Um, for anybody who doesn't know about liberating structures, I highly encourage you to check out the liberating structures online website. Uh, lots of different facilitation methodology, methodologies there. Uh, we do workshops on graphic facilitation. Uh, we have an educational technology user group conference that happens twice a year. Um, and as I was mentioning, we're getting back into that online learning work. Um, so we've had for a number of years a couple of courses about how to facilitate learning online uh, and what we do is we have a course that is facilitated that that educators take then they can take a course about how to facilitate that first course and we do that so that we can build capacity in the institutions so like Kim was saying, we do a lot of train the trainer. We do work directly with faculty, but we work a lot with the learning and teaching and, uh, centers in the BC institutions to help them um, so that they are more able to support faculty within their organizations. So that, that facilitating learning online course can be taken, for example, by an instructional designer who then takes the course about how to facilitate it. And then they get that first course as an open educational resource that they can use within in the institution uh, and continue to be part of a community of practice that's facilitating that learning. And we've also just recently taken um, that uh, those learning materials and made them into micro courses um, so that it was less of a time commitment for faculty to have to do all of that at once. Uh, and uh, finally, our collaborative projects um, arm, and that is we do uh, a number of sort of what I'll call special projects for government. And so these are uh, sometimes for our Ministry of Advanced Education, but sometimes for other ministries as well. Um, and so things like uh, health or um, Ministry of Children and Families will have uh, materials that they want to use. For example, um, one of the projects that we've done is brought uh, nurse educators together from the institutions around British Columbia to update the curriculum guide for some of the nursing programs. Um, indigenization is another area that we've done some work in as a collaborative project. So this is really about us going out into the system and working with the experts in that given uh, topic area to create a new policy, new resources, new practices uh, around doing that work. Um, and then I wanted to talk to us a little bit about success measures. Um, and because we're accountable to government, we have a number of um, 
I will call them quantitative um, items that we report out to government on, number of books in our textbooks collect collection, the number of people who came to events. Um, but we also do some conceptual um, work around advancing learning in the system, um, which is more qualitative, obviously. Um, and each of the areas that we have uh, does events and projects, and we collect data as they do to measure our success um, against each of those areas, and we publish that data in our annual report. Um, and we also measure against specific project goals or outcomes. Um, I would say we, uh, we, we feel like we're doing what we should be now, but it's taken us a few years to shift into that uh, and that has not been without tension both internal and external I would say um, but we feel like we're in a pretty good place now because we've um, done a lot of work to establish advisory capacities um, for us around the province from a really wide swath of our stakeholders and so uh, we get uh, fairly regular and constant feedback about our work and so that, that's another way uh, again that we measure our success. So I will stop talking now and um, we can go on to the next piece. Great, thank you so much. So folks, we do have um, an opportunity for questions to be typed into the questions section of GoToMeeting. So while you're thinking of great questions, um, I'll ask one of our panelists to kind of prime the pump. So, um, uh, both Kim and and Mary, um, how do you stay abreast of what your members need and how do you stay ahead of them? Um, so how do you stay current and how do you stay ahead of what they may want and what they need? So I'll jump in, um, uh, Tina, this is Kim. Um, so how do we stay abreast of what they need, I would say, we have um, two primary mechanisms. Um, I mentioned for each of those target audiences, we have a community of practice and um, we have uh, staff who regularly engage with those communities um, across the system throughout the year. And so we are attending um, virtual meetings with them, we're attending conferences with them. We have regular communication out to them and um, uh, and, you know, regular mechanisms throughout the year where they're reaching back out to us. So a lot happens, um, you know, just by engaging with them in the various ways that we do. Um, in addition to that, we do an annual survey, which I mentioned, which is to um, uh, ask them um, about the services that they feel are important for um, ensuring the success of their online learning initiatives. Um, and then again, how effective they think the services are that we're providing. So I think that's how we kind of stay aware of what their current needs are. Um, and we do get actually in some of those engagements feedback on what is coming down the pike. But I think through some of the um, engagements that I mentioned with our campus leaders and by being um, engaged in some of the strategic planning initiatives at the system level, um, you know, that's how we stay abreast of what we think is going to be needed in the future. Um, and of course, engaging with groups like, you know, WCET members. Um, so we try to, um, you know, stay engaged, stay abreast, and, um, and keep our ears to the ground wherever we are. Um, I will say that, um, you know, we kind of sit, um, as I think many of um, the organizations in our roles do, we sit between our system office um, which has, um, you know, kind of a role and a strategy for the entire system and the individual campuses who have their own missions and, um, you know, um, governance structures and initiatives. So we try to balance the serving the um, priorities of the system and the individual needs of the campuses. And sometimes that is a balancing act. But, um, but I really think it's all about engagement, both for what they currently need and what's coming in the future. Fantastic. Mary, any thoughts? 
Yeah, and I would echo that. I think we are we are also often walking the line between uh, what our funder um, would like to see happen and and what we're actually hearing on the ground from the institutions. So we we kind of walk that that balance beam a little bit as well. And I would say, in terms of staying abreast, it really is about being part of communities. It's re it's all about relationships. And I think um, so. Yeah, being part of groups like this, hanging out with people like Kim, uh, going to events where where we're going to learn about what is happening um, in other institutions and other systems. Um, we also try to be really connected to the people who I call the lead end of the pencil for anybody who knows about the pencil metaphor. Um, these are the lone rangers. These are the people out there who are just trying stuff. And we really try to stay connected to those people. Um, you know, we're always looking at the research and on Twitter and all of that sort of stuff. Uh, we also um, have been supporting faculty um, around some risk taking, I would, is, is kind of how I look at it, um, by providing funding for research projects and things that they may not be able to get funding for uh, within their institutions. So, for example, um, this spring we funded a project to assess uh, what it would be like for faculty to teach in a yurt. Uh, and yes, that sounds weird, but like, who knows, right? It's a different learning space and what might happen in there. And so that's the kind of, that's the kind of stuff that we look at in addition to all, all kinds of other things. But yeah, I, I think for us, it's, it's really about being connected and also about dropping the ego that we um, need to be the ones who know everything or that we do know everything um, and just being really open and curious to what's happening out there and, and listening all the time is, is kind of how we stay abreast. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. We actually have a few coming in from the chat. Um, the first uh, question is for Kim. Um, Kim, does your dashboard also gather information on course completion or just course registration? So what kind of data is showing on your dashboard? Yeah, good question. Um, so the dashboard that we share with campuses um, shows um, enrollments or registrations, as well as um, courses offered and numbers of students. We actually do have a dashboard that we only share internally right now um, that, that looks at some student success factors like graduations and course completions, um, but we have not um, shared that, that data back out with our campuses yet. Every campus can see that data themselves already. Um, uh, um, and so we just, you know, uh, feel like that's a little more um, sensitive. Um, uh, we may get there in the future, but um, right now just kind of sharing out um, uh, information on enrollments. I'll also say when we thought about our dashboards, that's another thing where we talked about, like, who our audiences were. So we knew we had our campus um, constituents, our campus stakeholders. So we have a set of dashboards for them. That's what I shared on um, the link that I shared in the um in the PowerPoint. We also have a dashboard for our staff. That's that kind of internal one that I mentioned that is looking at a little more at our services and some of the data and metrics around camp number of campuses participating in our services. And then we created a third dashboard for the system office, which is really about kind of the higher level data and outcomes that people like the chancellor and the provost and the CFO want to be looking at regularly. So um, I'd be happy to share um, those, um, uh, um, you know, the one that we share for, for the system office with anyone, if, if you'd like to see that. The internal one, I think, is still kind of sensitive. So, um, but we, th we thought about that relative to the target audiences, because while we have a lot of data, we try to really think about what each group would be interested in. Fantastic. Thank you. The next question is for both of you, um, and I'm going to read it. Um, I imagine that sometimes your services or efforts don't align with local institution processes or culture. What ways do your consortia engage in these challenge engage in these challenges at the institutional level? So, how do you reconcile the uh, local institutional processes, um, consortia, and the institution? Great question. 
Yeah, that is a great question. And, and as I said up front, we have a very diverse system here in BC and we have some um, some big research institutions like the University of British Columbia that bring in a lot of funding for themselves and that really frankly don't need BC campuses help for most of what they do um, versus some very small rural, rural colleges that have a much greater need for service. And so we're kind of always trying to um, really balance the system out, uh, I think is a big role that we play um, to, to kind of boost the have nots so that they have, um, so that they have enough resources to do the work. We also um, spend quite a bit of time working with institutions um, in collaboration with each other so that they can understand uh, some of the pressures across the system and really encouraging that collaborative model. But I would say one of the one of the big things is looking for those places for localization and actually embracing that. So trying to develop resources and services in ways that are um, generic enough to be useful, but flexible enough so that individual institutions can um, modify them to the degree that that it's going to work for them. So again, with that train the trainer model, where we're going in to talk about things at, at sort of a higher level, but then we're able to work with individual educators and um, academic support staff within the institutions to talk about their specific needs and about how they may customize or localize the materials or practices that that we're offering up so that they are more um, more suitable for their particular contexts. Great. Um, Kim, how about you? Yep, so um, I would say, um, wow, ditto to almost everything that, that Mary said. Um, again, we have also a very diverse system. We have the haves and the have-nots. Um, and, uh, and I think um, the way things get implemented campus, per, per camp, campus by campus can certainly vary. I think what we try to do is focus on, um, uh, we come back to kind of our role at the system office is really about, um, you know, kind of strategy. And um, um, we do have an uh, overall quality assurance role for the academic programs. So we try to kind of, um, uh, you know, um, stay to that role where we are providing standards and models and, um, you know, um, best practices, um, facilitating the sharing of best practices so that campuses can um, have the um, autonomy to implement in the way that they want, but still against the backdrop of something that we know is going to ensure quality. So. Um, you know, we have really tried to focus a lot on things like rubrics and models and, um, uh, you know, our, our consulting engagements that we have kind of bring those to the campus leaders uh, to try and make them aware of, of those models as well and, uh, and to try to um, just instill that expectation of um, ensuring quality for them. And so I think um, we do see a lot of variability in how things get implemented. Um, but we also see a lot of sharing, um, particularly within sectors like the community colleges will share with each other and the doctoral branding will share with each other. Um, and, and that plays out um, in some ways as well. Tina, this is Russ. I'd love to comment on this. Absolutely, please. Oh, that'd be great. Uh, I'm recalling when I worked with uh, our friends at Kansas State and uh, the Great Plains uh, idea project and the uh, that they were able to take their initial success and then put it out with uh, other consortia that were trying to get started. And one of the things that they were able to do was to uh, get together in some meetings uh, people of, of like positions, and so the be, be registrars or financial aid officers and such, to discuss through how do we how are we going to make this work? Because a lot of this was new at the time, and they had to uh, figure out figure out the processes. And that may not always be. Uh, easy to do, and certainly if you're in uh, uh, large organizations like Open SUNY uh, or what we're seeing at BC campus, it's hard to get everybody together. But it, but but the lesson that we got out of it is that it's really key to be able to find somebody in, let's say, the registrar community or the financial aid community or uh, or the uh, faculty leadership community who can help be the champion in talking to the other institutions because sometimes registrars only want to hear from other registrars if they can be told that, yeah, this we really can make this work and here's how we did it, that 
that goes a long way uh, uh, to really make uh, make that work because they do really want to hear from their their peers and are uh, interested in hearing from successful models at, at other institutions. Fantastic, thank you. Um, you know, it's interesting because as as we're talking through this, I'm struck by the longevity of of um, Open SUNY being around in different iterations for 25 years, CCC Online for 20, BC Campus for 15. Um, not every consortium survives. Um, you know, um, we've seen some really high functioning consortium, you know, get disbanded recently. And so one of the things that sits in the back of my mind always is how do we ensure that we're sustainable? How do we continue to be relevant? Um, how do we continue to meet the needs of, of the colleges and the universities and whoever our stakeholders are? How do we continue to, to serve those individuals? Um, Russ, any, any, any kind of gleanings out of conversations that you've had? Because I know you're super plugged in. Anything that maybe emerged from the survey that you could give those of us who are going, hmm, how do we stay relevant when things are so volatile and, and enrollments are declining? Any any thoughts? Yeah, that it, it, it was brought up before about the importance of relationships. And, and I forgot to mention that I'm a recovering uh, uh, leader of a consortium back in mean, my experience goes back uh, 20 years ago though this but one of the things that that we did was that we uh, really made sure to engage with the uh, uh, the presidents and provosts at the institutions and keep them up to speed in terms of what uh, what we were doing and then also with our with our board and let them know what was going uh, going on uh, quite a bit because I I think uh, some of these decisions um, thinking about some of the more recent ones that they got made at probably a lower level and that if you could get out it, it, <clears throat> part of the key is that if you can get uh, the leadership engaged to know that you're providing a valuable service and that you uh, it, and that it is something that will be will be missed that that's really really helpful and then also uh, sort of challenging some of the fiscal numbers that was kind of the uh, the, the problem I've seen a, a couple times is that uh, that I've seen a couple of these uh, consortia were were killed in order to save money, but then when you added up the the numbers at the end, it didn't save any money. So you have to get back to uh, okay, w what are the real reasons behind behind killing this, or what really happened happened there? And so um, that's something that you can can raise if you have the the ear of the leadership. And I'll leave it at that. Fantastic. Um, it looks like we have no further questions from the audiences. I will um, put in a shameless plug, moderator's preference, right? I, I'm going to put in a shameless plug for the consortium session at the annual meeting. I believe it's a pre-conference session. Um, please attend. Um, this will be probably the fourth or fifth that I've participated in. I always walk away with really great ideas um, and it's always a rich conversation. So with that, I'll turn it over back to Megan. Great, thank you so much. And here's some contact information if you would like to follow up with any of our presenters. And Stay tuned to WCET. If this is your first webcast with us, we tend to do monthly webcasts, and we always post the, the updates on our website as well as links to the PowerPoint slides and the recordings. And the recordings are captioned, so those will be available as well. As Tina and Russ both mentioned, we have a pre-conference workshop coming up on October 3rd during our 30th annual meeting and celebration in Portland. Registration is open and the program is posted. Again, access to the webcast. And I do want to do a quick thank you to our supporting members and 
especially Wiley Education Services. They're one of our top sponsors and they helped underwrite much of this research and this webcast series that has been taking place on consortia. So big shout out to them as well as all of the other sponsors that help underwrite our programs and events here at WCET. So thank you to our speakers. Thank you for attending and presenting your wonderful questions and good luck with your initiatives as they move forward. And we'll see you on the next WCET webcast. Thanks all. Thanks everybody.